Good evening, everyone. I'm Brian Simmons. I'm Vice President of Communications at the Arcus Foundation. I think you all know uh, we were founded 15 years ago by John Stryker uh, with the idea that um, we would promote a respect for diversity among peoples and throughout the natural world. Um, we're probably best known for our grant making work, which is extensive both in conservation and in LGBT equality. Um, I wanted to say a couple of words to you about this forum and others like it that we've been hosting the last uh, couple of years. Um, about two years ago, we were having conversations inside the foundation about how the importance of public conversations in terms of policy and practice and uh, realized that this was another contribution that we could make uh, beyond the funding uh, that we, uh, that we uh, engage in uh, to try to uh, create an environment that was uh, more conducive to the success of the work our grantees are doing. So this is, uh, I think, maybe the fourth or fifth in um, this relatively new experiment of ours. Um, you might have heard that about a month ago we did a forum, we hosted a forum in Los Angeles about animals and entertainment. But tonight, of course, um, our topic is industrial agriculture. And I won't get into reviewing um, uh, the panelists. I'll, I'll let Catherine Workman, our uh, moderator, uh, explain all of that to you. But I did, uh, do need to say a couple of more things to you about, uh, about this uh, forum. We chose Washington because um, this is a um, city where there are so many people uh, living here, a tremendous number of people who are in a position or will be in a position one day to um, affect uh, positive change in both policy uh, and practice or uh, in industry. In Los Angeles, uh, naturally, we were focused on uh, the community there that has a tremendous position uh, in terms of determining the experience that animals do have in entertainment. So the locales are chosen with those kinds of um, relationships in mind. Just before we get started, I want to let you know that this is being live streamed. Um, so that will become relevant uh, when we get to the question and answer portion of the, of the program. And we also encourage you, um, normally we are telling people to put away their phones, but I'm actually going to encourage you to feel free to tweet uh, if you like. Um, the hashtag for this event is hashtag Arcus Forum. And uh, finally, I want to make sure you don't miss the fact that there is a memory card in your program uh, with the contents of, uh, the, of a, um, the first in a series of books that the foundation has been working on with the Cambridge University Press, um, led by our Great Apes team, the first uh, in the series was on extractive industries and their relationship to the well-being of the great apes and their, their habitats and other species living under the same canopy. And upcoming um, in just the next several weeks, uh, Cambridge University Press will be publishing the second in the series, which is, uh, relates to tonight's topic, industrial agriculture. So uh, with that, I'm going to invite Catherine Workman to join me on stage and get things going. Uh, my name is Catherine Workman. I'm the Senior Director of the Protecting Wildlife Initiative here at National Geographic, and I welcome all of you here tonight. We are a planet of more than 7 billion people. With an ever-growing population, agribusiness, or large-scale commercial agriculture, has raced to keep pace with the demand for more goods, clearing large tracts of land to feed and fuel the world. But of course, some of these regions where this is happening overlap with the habitat of the planet's most endangered species, including the great apes. Joining me tonight to discuss how agribusiness can continue to meet global demand while ensuring the environment, including the endangered species, are protected is, um, to my immediate left, Marc Ancranaz. Marc is the co-founder of the French NGO Hutan and also the co-founder of the Borneo Futures Initiative that aims at providing cutting-edge science to increase awareness, 
collaboration, and understanding among decision makers, media, NGOs, and the general public in Borneo. Next to Mark is Doug Boucher. Doug is the Director of Climate Research and Analysis for the Union of Concerned Scientists. Uh, Doug's work focuses on tropical deforestation, global land use, and their role in climate change. Next to Doug is Lorenzo Cotula, the principal researcher in law and sustainable develop development at the International Institute for Environment and Development, a think tank based in the UK. And finally, on the end, we have Glenn Hurowitz, who is the senior fellow at the Center for International Policy. Glenn's work contribute, has contributed to the adoption of strong forest conservation policies by companies that cover approximately 90% of the global palm oil trade. And that's just an abbreviated version of their very illustrious biographies. So please help me in welcoming them here tonight. Um, I want to start off um, with an event, a situation that's very timely and I think is probably on the minds of most of the people that came here tonight, which, is, um, which are the wildfires that are raging in Indonesia. Um, and I'm going to start with Mark um, first to talk about what you're hearing on the ground from your colleagues in terms of um, the impacts specifically to wildlife and um, orangutans as these forests um, are burning. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Yes. Um well, the situation is very extremely bad this year. I think that we all know that forests in Southeast Asia are burning every year, but this year the situation is even worse than usual because there is a very intense drought in the region. We still don't know how many, what is the size of the forest we have lost so far. People are already speaking about 2 million hectares, and this is just the beginning because El Nino, the drought, is going to last for another few months. So in the field, I'm sure that all of us have seen pictures of people suffering, but also wildlife, because of course the animals are losing their, uh, their forest, their home, so they disappear, they are killed. And worse, I mean, something else that we need to realize is that there is a direct impact when the forest is destroyed, but there is also an indirect impact that is going to last for the next few months or even a couple of years. Mm -hmm. Because of the haze that is currently raging in Southeast Asia, a lot of um, ecosystems are completely disrupted. And we know that in the past, when we had similar events, for example, pollinators, the small insects, were just gone, destroyed. And so when we don't have pollinators in the forest, there is less food available, there is less food available. And this kind of um, uh, recall impact is going to hit wildlife in the next few months. So even in these places where the forest has not been burned or won't burn, animals are going to suffer. Animals and also people, because this is it's really a tragedy. I mean, some of our colleagues are calling this the uh, worst um, environmental crime of the century, and indeed it is, because people are suffering as well. So the situation is very, very extremely bad right now. Yeah, and um, Doug, this is an annual burn, right, um, to both small scale slash and burn, but also more larger targeted burns, and if you could speak um, about the impacts right now on, on human health and the climate, and then um, I'm going to turn it over to the other two as well. Yes, it's, it's really it's something that has, has very large effects on, on people and on the climate system. Um, it's particularly bad when peat is burned. Uh, tropical Southeast Asia is, is really the, the largest, by far the largest area of, of tropical peat. And it's been estimated that about a fifth of greenhouse gas emissions from tropical deforestation, degradation, clearing are, are due to peat. That's, that's over a million tons of carbon dioxide um, on the average. It's clearly going to be considerably more this year, uh, estimates of, uh, of, of, of perhaps twice that much, uh, uh, perhaps rivaling the, the emissions of the United States. Um, and it's also something that has direct effects on the health of the people in the region. The, the estimated uh, average mortality, and this is average over many years, is over 100,000 deaths per year uh, due to respiratory diseases above all, things like asthma and, and, and uh, childhood uh, respiratory problems of various kinds. So this, this is really something that, 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 that hits home very directly to the populations in the region, and, and people are, are, are very cognizant of it. 
um, you know, haze is, is something that you see, and you see it every year, and this year it's, as, as Mark said, going to be particularly bad, partly because we're in an El Nino year, um, but also because of the, the increasing problem with the development of the oil palm industry, the pulp and paper plantations, and the other, uh, the other uh, large-scale agricultural uh, developments in the region. Right, so Glenn, can you speak about why the, the fires? So is it for, for palm oil, <coughs> for pulp, for paper? What was the impetus for this? Yeah, thing? those are the two major commodities driving deforestation and haze in, in Southeast Asia. There are others like uh, rubber and sugar as well. Um, you know, I think we've seen this really paradoxical situation, and it, it shows in some ways how much work we have left to do. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, companies covering more than 90% of global palm oil trade have committed to very strong forest conservation policies. Uh, and, and that has not only you know, contributed to conservation directly within their own supply chains, uh, but also has contributed to something of a political realignment. Uh, the same companies that used to lobby and bribe the government to weaken forest law enforcement uh, are now actually advocates for conservation. But a weird thing happened when the Hayes crisis started. Uh, even though you suddenly had some of the most politically powerful companies in Indonesia uh, advocating uh, not only for not burning uh, forests as a means to clear it, but you know, conserving even uh, secondary and just sort of minimal regrowth forests, the government suddenly launched these uh, relentless attacks on those companies for trying to protect forests. Mm. And so you have to ask yourself, why is this happening, especially as this Hayes crisis is emerging? And one of the reasons is that their action in the private sector to protect forests through their supply chains was actually starting to pinch some of the rogue suppliers. Right before the Hayes crisis emerged, uh, consensus had emerged among the biggest players in the palm oil industry that not only would they make sure that they wouldn't buy from uh, palm oil companies that were deforesting within their own supply chains, but if any other major company said that this company was on a kind of blacklist, they also wouldn't buy. Mm -hmm. And suddenly, rogue suppliers who wanted to burn, who wanted to clear, had nowhere to go except to go to the government. And they went to uh, some bad actors in the government who uh, started to blast these companies for doing conservation. And you know, unfortunately, and I think this is where the companies could do better, a lot of them were intimidated. And consumer companies around the world, like Unilever and Procter & Gamble, uh, that have their own commitments not to sell products associated with deforestation, didn't speak up enough. Uh, and it, it kind of spiraled out of control. Um, and so you know, ultimately, the government does bear responsibility. I think we're finally. Um, uh, you know, as a result of that, I think a lot of the law enforcement authorities weren't acting strongly enough against uh, companies and individuals that were engaged in burning. Uh, I think we're finally starting to turn the corner politically just because things have gotten so bad. Uh, it, it's, I hope, no longer tenable in Indonesia to attack the very people that are actually trying to drive conservation. Um, but, you know, there needs to be so much done now. Uh, there's a lot to make up for. We've lost two million hectares uh, just in the last five months. Uh, that's way more than even Indonesia usually burns. And uh, you know, I think ultimately what the private sector has done created the opportunity for the Indonesian government to dramatically reduce deforestation. But it's, it's an opportunity that they have to seize and they haven't really seized it yet. Thanks. Lorenzo, did you want to, did you want to weigh in in terms of the, the legal frameworks or the policy driving? But maybe just on this point of the, um, the crops and the drivers, because uh, um, the narrative that has been uh, used at the global level for the past 10 years or so is this narrative of feeding a planet that in 2050 will have 9 billion people. And one, one looks at the actual crops that are being grown, you see that the emphasis is not so much on food crops. The emphasis is either on crops that can uh, be used for multiple purposes, multi-flex crops such as palm oil, sugarcane, or agro-industrial crops such as rubber. Uh, and, and so it really, there's a, first of all a question around, is this really about uh, feeding the planet? Is it about the consumption agenda and, and the way in which our consumption levels are driving this? Um, and, in some ways, some of these crops actually have been around for a long time. I mean, our research has been focusing on sub-Saharan Africa, working with partners in, in uh, several countries that have been uh, uh, experiencing these uh, increased uh, levels of uh, uh, agro-industrial um, uh, ventures. 
And you know, in some of these countries, palm oil has been there for a long time, since colonial times in Cameroon or DRC, you had very large plantations, uh, rubber also a colonial uh, crop. But we're now seeing a, a, a significant changes in the ways in which uh, these crops are being rolled out in terms of scale. So the scale could be significant, far more uh, substantial than was the case in many of these countries. Secondly, in terms of actors, in particular the involvement of the finance sector in agriculture, the financialization of agriculture is a new phenomenon. The geographic origin, we see companies from Southeast Asia moving to Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, to establish very large palm oil plantations, partly because of land price differentials. Land is much cheaper in Africa, uh, is perceived to be abundant in Africa. Uh, transport costs for exporting to Europe are lower. Um, so there's a number of factors and possibly also uh, the greater scrutiny that is, uh, and, and the tightening policy frameworks in Southeast Asia having perhaps a leakage effect whereby some of the players are moving to, to Africa. So we're seeing very much a continuation of some long-standing patterns that I think we need to be very well aware of in understanding what's going on, but equally some new dimensions that really create new challenges in terms of how to address it, what sort of solutions can actually work. Yeah, that's really helpful. And actually, just to kind of set the stage in terms of what we're talking about when we talk about um, industrial agriculture, large-scale commercial agriculture, um, what are the crops? Palm oil obviously comes to mind. We all know palm oil and orangutans and the impacts on them and their habitat. What, what other crops? You mentioned a few. Um, what, what, other, what crops are we talking about when we say this? Is there like a dirty dozen, a dirty half dozen? Um, and how do, uh, yeah, okay. It, and it, how do those maybe differ between Africa and Asia, right? It's actually a, quite a small number of crops and very different depending on which continent you're on. Um, Southeast Asia, it's, it's palm oil and, uh, and pulp and paper yeah. plantations and associated with that the timber industry um, overwhelmingly. Um, on, on the contrary, in Amazonia, in, in Latin America, um, it is uh, beef and soy. Um, uh, totally different with, with you know, very little um, uh, uh, entry of, of, of palm to, uh, to date and uh, uh, relatively little impact to the timber industry, although it, it often is what creates the roads that lead to the cattle farmers, the, the cattle ranchers and the, the soybean farmers following. Um, Africa is, is, is really the, the only continent in which it's, it's still somewhat substantially small farmers, as well as uh, charcoal producers, um, and of course, you know, very relevant for, for the great apes, uh, the bushmeat trade, yeah. um, which is associated um, with, with some plantations and also with, with uh, centers of mining in, in many cases. And, and, more broadly associated with, uh, with uh, hunting that, that often provides a substantial amount of meat for, for uh, urban areas. So the drivers are really very, very different in the, in the different regions, but it's a small number of crops, really. What about to circle back to the burning? Is burning as a tactic for clearing land, is that um, for all any of uh, these large-scale crops, is it particularly in Southeast Asia, is it particularly for palm oil or pulp? What about tactics for? Is, 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 are fires used in West Africa as well? Fires are certainly a feature in tropical <coughs> culture around the world, but traditionally they've been used mostly by smallholders and less by companies. Uh, there is large-scale land clearing using fire for pasture in, in Latin America. Um, where governance is better, uh, there tends to be less fire. And I think one of the things that you're seeing in Southeast Asia right now is actually that the fires are in Indonesia where governance has not been as good. Uh, and if you look, there's, there's not as much burning in Malaysia, even in uh, parts of Malaysian Borneo as we've seen in Indonesia. Um, and so I, I think you know, when we look at Latin America, it actually can give you some hope because uh, Brazil used to be uh, by far the biggest deforester in the world. Uh, they had developed new varieties of soybeans that could grow in the tropics for the first time and that led to a massive explosion of soybean plantations. And it, it looked a lot like what was happening uh, in Sumatra and Borneo uh, now in Indonesia. Um, but what happened was there was a global outcry from consumers, and consumers put pressure through campaigns on companies like McDonald's uh, not to buy from big agricultural suppliers like ADM, Bungie, and Cargill that were sourcing from people engaged in deforestation. As a result of that, it caused an almost overnight turnaround. Those big companies said, well, our consumers are demanding responsible products uh, from, from the Amazon. So they banded together and cre created the Brazilian soy moratorium. Uh, 
Uh, and that has, they said, we're not going to buy from any district that has deforestation going on. It worked like gangbusters. Deforestation declined within three years from 25% of Amazon deforestation for soy to 0.25%. And there was similar progress through similar processes in the cattle sector, and that has led to, along with other uh, improvements, a decline in uh, Brazilian Amazon deforestation by about two-thirds. It's probably the biggest climate success story in the world. We've been trying to replicate that model in Southeast Asia in the palm oil industry. And you know, we've got to the point where the big companies are at the same place where they're willing to commit. I think so far there has not yet been that breakthrough in government because the Brazilian government, the Brazilian environmental movement, the Brazilian people really saw that progress was possible there and backed it. And I don't think that we're quite there yet in Indonesia. I, yeah. I just add, as, as Glenn highlights, that the, the success of reducing deforestation in, in Brazil is, 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 I would say, really a historic change. Um, Brazil, not any of the European countries, not the US, um, is the country that has reduced its greenhouse gas emissions the most over the past decade. And it's done that fundamentally by, by, by reducing deforestation so much. The rest of, of the economy has had an increase in emissions. And, and it's particularly notable because the two major industries responsible, um, soy and, and beef, continue to be profitable. Uh, continue to grow in terms of their output, in terms of the size of the cattle herd, um, but they're doing it now without deforestation or with much less deforestation. They're doing it on already cleared land, for example. So it's really, it's, it's really a striking example of, of what is possible and, and frankly what is possible in a much shorter time than the experts, myself mm -hmm. included, expected would, would be possible. This might be a good time, actually, to kind of take us back, Doug, and set the stage in terms of the chronology of deforestation and patterns in the 20th and 21st century, kind of bring us up to date about how we got to where yeah. we are in terms of um, the scale, where and why, and kind of the onset of this, this large-scale commercialization of agriculture. Sure. Well, you know, I'm old enough that I've actually lived some of this history myself. And, and when I started working in tropical forests, this was in Costa Rica in the early 70s with a, uh, as, as a Peace Corps volunteer, um, both the narrative and I think to a substantial extent the reality was that deforestation um, was due to peasants, was due to small scale production, shifting cultivation, um, firewood collection, uh, and, and to growing populations. And uh, what we've seen in the, the later years of the 20th century, and certainly very dramatically in, in the 21st century, is that deforestation is, is no longer driven by small producers, small holders. Um, it's now commercial, it's large scale, um, it's driven by demand, not for food to feed one's family, as, as, as the phrase used to go, um, but uh, by production for urban markets and for international export markets, for global markets. So the soybean being produced uh, in, in Brazil, its biggest single market um, is China, um, and it's being exported in, in, in very large quantities. Um, the palm oil uh, is being exported to, to North America, to Europe, to India, to China. Um, with only a minority of it actually being, being consumed in, in Southeast Asia. And that's, that's really a fundamental shift. The, the, the agents of deforestation in the 21st century um, are big, are driven by markets. Um, they are, are, are producing uh, for uh, people who do not live in the rural areas, certainly not for, for the uh, 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 rural poor, but, but as, as Lorenzo was pointing out, to, to satisfy some some growing demand, not, not for food to survive, but for profits, for making some money, uh, um, in many cases, uh, 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 quite successfully. Thanks. Lorenzo or Glenn? Maybe just <coughs> on that, I was just, I wanted to uh, pick up on the fact that uh, over the past 10 years, there's been a surge. So there's this long-term historical trajectory, but there's also been a surge in the level of um, agribusiness activity, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, large-scale land acquisitions for industrial agriculture, which have attracted a lot of attention in the media under the banner of land grabbing, 
uh, with a lot of attention being paid to countries such as Ethiopia, Mozambique, but in fact several uh, eight range states have also been affected. I mentioned Cameroon, uh, our partners, the Center for Environment and Development, they just completed a study in Cameroon to look at that, but the DRC and several other countries have also been affected. And I think the question is what happened over the past 10 years? Why are we seeing this surge? And I think a key moment has been 2007, 2008, when there's been the uh, spike in agricultural commodity prices that has really changed the distribution of risks and returns in agricultural commodity chains. Until then, prices were low, and so there was little money to be made from farming. And all of a sudden, farming became much more attractive to business operators because you could actually make money from it. Not only that, but also uh, for companies that until then focused on the processing side and the distribution side, because of the volatility of the price, it also became very risky not to engage in production because uh, they, were, they had concerns they wouldn't be able to source their produce, the, the produce they needed for their, for their activities. And so there were both new, entra new entrants in the market and also uh, um, downstream players that started to vertically integrate to start producing directly through very large plantations, uh, moving uh, on from just focusing on processing. I think what we've seen now the past four or five years is that the, pan the, the, the landscape is, sh is shifting again. Agricultural commodity prices are much lower now. Uh, the oil prices change. That's also very important because biofuels have been a key driver of this. And of course, a lower price of oil uh, decreases the attractiveness of, of, of biofuels. So we've seen a slowdown actually in the level of uh, land acquisition in several countries. Uh, I would think that uh, I would say that we still need to be uh, vigilant in moving forward because actually ultimately land prices are widely expected to increase, particularly in places like Africa where at the moment they're very low. Uh, so in the longer term, the interest on the part of business players to, to acquire land, uh, agriculturally valuable land in Africa will continue to rise. And that in turn will um, uh, continue to increase pressure on ecosystems, including, including ape habitats. So we've seen really a change over the past 10 years, and it's really unfolding very rapidly. Uh, but I think in the medium to longer term, what we'll see is growing pressure on, on the resources rather than less. That's really helpful. Glenn, how would you characterize the current state? Well, I think one of the interesting things that we saw, uh, both positive and negative, is that, as Lorenzo said, when biofuel demand, uh, due to both uh, American and European uh, mandates to use biofuels uh, instead of gasoline, hit, uh, that led to a surge of biofuel projects in Africa. But more recently, Europe has actually put some sustainability limits uh, and an overall cap on uh, the amount of biofuels that can be used. It's actually fairly weak. It doesn't go nearly far enough. But what we saw when we worked with the Arcus Foundation on their State of the Great Apes uh, uh, book, uh, State of the Apes book, we saw that actually even that very limited uh, cap on biofuel production had led to a dramatic falling away of interest in Africa in developing biofuel projects. And so it gave a little bit of a breather uh, to allow conservation mechanisms to be put in place. Um, and, and actually, uh, you know, we have seen this surge of interest uh, from Asian companies uh, to come into Africa and develop palm oil plantations in particular, um, rubber and other commodities as well, uh, going on top of, you know, longstanding timber interests. Um, what, because a lot of these companies have adopted these no deforestation policies, you actually see that they are implementing in Africa strong conservation policies. And it's actually, in some cases, led to a political realignment. Uh, the government of Liberia, one of the poorest countries in the world, uh, actually last September uh, agreed as part of a, a deal with Norway uh, that in exchange for some development support, they would not only do things like do have better protection for national parks, uh, but they would also actually adopt uh, the strong conservation policy adopted by Wilmar International, which is Asia's leading agribusiness company and the largest palm oil company in the world, and also has the strongest conservation policy, they would adopt that as national policy. So, you know, we always have this theory of change uh, that if you realign the private sector, you could actually change what government did. Uh, and here in Liberia, one of the most unlikely places, uh, at least at the policy level and the commitment level, so far it's actually come, come true. So if you want to you know, develop a plantation in Liberia, you are supposed to uh, obey, by national policy, these very strong conservation standards. I think we would really like to see that model replicated uh, in other parts of Africa. And indeed, it would be good to have it actually replicated in practice in Asia, uh, where it, it hasn't quite happened yet. 
Yeah, because one of the problems is that it depends on the governance and the policies that are in place. Is countries like Malaysia and Indonesia, you don't have this kind of policies in place. So when a land is assigned for agriculture development, the land has to be developed. And this is where the policies need to be changed if we really want to, um, to reach our conservation goals as well. So there's still a lot of work to do, even in Southeast Asia, where palm oil has been developed over the past two or three decades already. Yeah, actually, Mark, bringing it back to Southeast Asia and your neck of the woods, um, your research looks at how orangutans can adapt, do adapt in and around palm oil plantations and modified habitat. Can you talk a little bit about your research and how it's informing um, conservation plan planning on the ground? Yeah, very briefly. I remember when I started to do this kind of work, conservation, 30 years ago, the timber industry was one of the worst enemies of conservationists because we thought, ah, it's not good to exploit the forest. Animals are disappearing. Today, they are one of the, our allies because we have re realized that a well-managed timber concession can really accommodate the needs of wildlife. To me, agriculture, is, I'm, I'm trying to look at it the same way. The agro industry is going to stay, we like it or not, it's going to develop even more because there is an increasing need for all these commodities. So what we are trying to do, one thing we are trying to do in Sabah, in Malaysia, where I am working, is to try to understand the interface between the orangutan and oil palm development, oil palm agriculture and these crops. So we are following animals and we are trying to see if these animals can adapt to this new land uh, landscape, man-made landscapes. And indeed, it's quite amazing to see that animals like orangutan, who are of course very smart, they can adapt as long as you give them a chance. So the first thing is hunting has to be controlled. If of course the animals are hunted, you lose them. There is no doubt about this. But if the plantations are developed in such a way where there is still natural habitat retained, in terms of corridors or patches of forest here and there, what we will see is that the orangutans will use these corridors of forest to move from one patch of forest to the next. And if people are able to live with these orangutans around them, I think a balance can be found. And we can have a landscape where the agriculture is going to produce all what it is um, supposed to produce, but also you will have species like orangutans and other animals that can survive. I don't say that orangutans can survive in a pure palm oil plantation, but if we have a mix of uh, production plus natural forest, a lot of species will do. And I think this is a hope as well, to come up with better designs for these new man-made landscapes. Yeah. This, is, this is necessary and this is urgent to come up with this kind of idea, this kind of information, and to share that with the industry, to share that with the government, to share that with the people who are going to develop this landscape. So then who implements that? If you come up with the best, the, the best type of design for uh, orangutans being able to survive in a modified plantation yeah. habitat, is that working with industry? Is it working with government? Does it need to be a combination of both? And yeah. We need a combination of both, and I, I think that we already realized it's not that easy. But I think that the first buyer is the industry in itself, and that a lot of companies nowadays are really keen on listening to this kind of facts and to try to improve their own um, practices on the ground. And then after that, we have, of course, to engage with the government to change policies if needed or to make sure that the best possible policies are um, adopted by these governments. And you need a lot of awareness. You need to work a lot with the people on the ground because, of course, in this kind of dream we have, we will ask people who are living in Africa or in Southeast Asia to share the same landscape, the same place with animals like gorillas, chimpanzees in Africa or orangutans in, uh, in Southeast Asia. And it's not necessarily easy because sometimes you have conflict. Sure. So we have to work also on these issues and to make sure that people and wildlife can cohabit together. Uh, to follow up, you mentioned African apes. Are, are there similar studies going on to yours and Hutans of how um, gorillas and chimps are able to well, in, in Af I'm adapt sure that, yeah. in similarly modified massive plantations. There is still not many places covered with massive plantation in Africa, so we still don't have, um, if you want, uh, the time to study that. But a lot of people are studying chimpanzees, for example, where um, we have kind of mosaic agriculture. A lot of these species can adapt and will survive as long as there is no hunting. And this is, once again, this will be the key issue. We are now working, um, we are now <laughs> speaking about 
agro-industry um, as a driver of um, extermination, and it's true that it's a real driver. But more importantly than that, hunting is a real issue. Mm. So in, in these places where people are developing agriculture, of course, if they start to hunt animals, animals are gone, if somehow hunting can be controlled, a lot of species will, uh, yeah, will survive. So chimpanzees can survive. The problem with chimpanzees is that they are living in big groups and they can be aggressive sometimes. So there will be more awareness and more education to be done to really make sure that we mitigate the conflict. But I think it's doable. I wonder what, you mentioned Liberia, we're talking about what's happening in Southeast Asia. Where, where are best practices um, being shared or not, um, or what's working and what's not? Is that an active conversation that's going, um, going on? Yeah, and you know, we, we talked a little bit about the example of Brazil and the success mm -hmm. there. Um, that is, is being shared, you know, the, the, the whole phenomenon of South-South cooperation. So Brazil, for example, working with the Portuguese uh, former colonies in Africa um, is, is, is an example of that. Um, there are smaller countries that are, are also uh, uh, quite good examples in terms of reducing deforestation. Uh, uh, Mexico, which is actually not that small, Costa Rica, which I think everybody uh, talks about and knows about, um, and, and some countries that have actually reached the low point in terms of forest cover and have begun to increase that again. So you actually have reforestation on a net basis going on. And you, you find this in, in, in widely divergent countries, you know, the Dominican Republic and uh, Vietnam and uh, Gambia. Uh, this, this phenomenon of the forest transition where you, you reach sometimes a, a, a disastrously low level of, of forest cover and then uh, it, it begins to, to grow back again for, for various reasons that uh, have been uh, debated by geographers. I think it's a, a, a phenomenon that we've, we've already seen in the temperate zone, in the boreal zone. It's happened in the United States. It's happened in Europe and Japan. Uh, and increasingly, we're starting to see it in, in various tropical countries. And over the long run, I think that, that's an immense reason for hope. It's, it's, it's a reason that we can see that although you know, there are some disastrous examples right now, um, that's no reason to give up, that, that, that it is possible to get past that. Uh, it is possible to restore forests and to actually have, have uh, uh, substantial forest growth. And from the point of view of climate, that's, that's not just good, that's necessary. Mm -hmm. um, if we're going to keep climate change from reaching the, the dangerous levels, we not only have to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions you know, essentially to zero, uh, we actually have to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And, you know, there's only one practical technology that can do that, and it's called trees. Um, and that's why reforestation in, in the second half of the 21st century, I think, is going to be so important to, to whether we have a, a dangerous uh, climate future. Lorenzo and Glenn, uh, Mark was talking about, you know, we think of Southeast Asia as being kind of ground zero for oil palm. Um, as it develops, but it's more nascent in West Africa. What, what you know, you mentioned Liberia. Um, is, there, is there an interest, is there a desire to learn from mistakes made, um, lessons learned from what's happened in Southeast Asia as these countries begin to develop some of the some palm oil, but other um, industries as well? Well, it's, it's interesting because it's really now mostly Asian companies that are driving deforestation in Africa. Uh, they've actually, you, you, if you fly over Africa, you see all these abandoned plantations from the colonial era. Uh, and it shows that actually it can be quite challenging uh, to have plantations in Africa. There's actually um, climactic reasons that they don't always um, uh, produce the same yields as in parts of Asia. Uh, and there's also, you know, Africa is um, the what a lot of companies that are trying to expand their plantations are finding is that the communities are actually quite strong and they often don't want plantation development. And so there's a lot more resistance than they're used to finding in Asia. A lot of these Asian companies went to Africa and they thought it was just like the good old days in Sumatra and Borneo. Uh, you know, there's cheap land, cheap labor, and bribable governments. Uh, and that is to a great extent true, but there's also other obstacles. Um, 
I, I do also think that one of the interesting things that we've had success with so, to some extent so far in Africa is that the Asian companies and others have actually faced a lot of pressure not to develop Africa in the same way that they've done in Indonesia. And so a lot of the same companies that are operating in Africa are the same ones that have adopted these no deforestation policies. Wilmar in Nigeria is working actually pretty hard to implement strong conservation practices there. And they're spreading that to companies like Golden Agri Resources and, and Syme Darby. Implementation hasn't always been perfect. And there are also companies like Olam, which has a big concession in Gabon, which is clearing some really valuable forest that's likely habitat for great apes, elephants, and, and other animals. Um, I, I do think that you've, you have seen this phenomenon. You know, I, th I think when we always say, like, it's sometimes hard to get global attention on a particular small palm oil company, you know, even doing something terrible in Southeast Asia. Because it's not news when a palm oil company does palm oil company thing. That's just what people expect. However, when people are going to these, you know, really frontier areas in Africa that are home to some of the last great forests that are still intact, that is shocking. And when they're doing it on chimpanzee habitat or gorilla habitat or bonobo ha habitat, it, it does stir people's consciences. They, they don't have that expectation for plantation agriculture in the same way in Africa that I think they've unfortunately become accustomed to in, in Africa. Um, and then you know we can talk about this more later, but I, I do think that that shows continuing the role for people around the world that we actually do have power. Um, <laughs> through campaigns, through influencing companies, through influencing our governments and other governments uh, to make a difference on what happens on the ground, even thousands of miles away. Yeah, that's, that's great, Mark. Yeah. What's up? I was just going to add, add to that, that uh, in, in addition to the role of uh, Asian companies, uh, we should not forget uh, about the role of European and North American companies in Sub-Saharan Africa in particular. And in fact, uh, I mean, da finding reliable data is still difficult despite uh, several years now into the phenomenon. But uh, some data sets suggest that for Sub-Saharan Africa as a whole, between 50 and 60 percent of land acquisition was actually driven by European and, and North American companies. So in fact, the phenomenon is actually rooted here and in Europe more than, than uh, sometimes is uh, um, as comes across from media reports and, mm -hmm. and the like. So that's one point. Another point is that it is indeed true that uh, in, um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, the phenomenon is much more nascent. And we don't have, you know, there isn't a 30-year history at, at this scale, at least, although I mentioned the sort of the colonial experiences. But it's also true that some individual uh, plantations or land deals are extremely large, you know, 350,000 hectares for individual deals to develop a plantation of that scale, that's a lot of land. Uh, so the impacts of operations like that are going to be quite substantial and finally the trajectory uh, moving forward uh, uh, is, is uh, likely to see a growing interest in in uh, and a growing role of uh, these operations in Africa. So I think uh, it's, it's, it's important to mention that. And uh, I was also hoping to touch on the, on the legal frameworks, because yeah. you mentioned the, to you next the, 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 the solutions. And, sort of, and I think <coughs> uh, uh, the, what we're seeing, essentially, is growing pressures on, 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 on ecosystems and on, and on natural resources. And, and one of the ways in which uh, those pressures uh, are meant to be uh, managed is through legal frameworks, is through uh, robust legislation, and and and, uh, and not only uh, uh, on paper but properly implemented. And I think it's quite often said that uh, that uh, the laws are good on paper, and but the problem is the implementation. I think that's true to some extent. Uh, if one looks at environmental legislation over the past 20 years, most of these countries have adopted uh, environmental codes that are you know, sort of uh, uh, in line with uh, global standards, and the problem is that they're the lacking regulations, then the implementing regulations, they are not implemented. But I think there are also some problems in the ways in which uh, the legal frameworks are, are, have shaped this phenomenon. And, uh, and, uh, and we need to look beyond environmental codes uh, if, if we want to make sense of what's happening. For, for example, who controls the land? Who's, who's got the authority to allocate the land? Who, issue, who issues the concessions? I mean, that's a key issue. And, and uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, a recurring pattern, although countries are different, is that the state, the central government, is the one that controls much of the land in the country, either because they own it or because they otherwise administer it. Uh, so that 
that's one element. Another element is that uh, people who have used the land for generations have claimed that land as their customary land may have, in the law, very weak rights to that land. So they've got very little control over what's happening, who's, the allocations that are being made. Uh, and then third element of that equation is the fact that there are very limited avenues for transparency, for public participation, for accountability in these processes. And so that's been a key enabler of the wave of large-scale land acquisitions. That's how you can have a, a single plantation of 350,000 hectares, because all you need is to go to the government and negotiate a concession. Uh, and then the issue is payments of compensation and sort of minimizing harm, as it were. But actually, the decision has been made. So I think there is a need to look at uh, these issues in, uh, in, in, a, in a more holistic way. And, and, and I think that strengthening local rights to land, uh, strengthening mechanism for transparency, for participation, for accountability is critical, uh, even before looking in, uh, at the legislation that specifically looks at uh, environmental protection. Uh, another element uh, of this is the fact that some of the environmental legislation is uh, is designed in ways that perhaps do not fully reflect the nature of the challenge that agri uh, agri industrial agriculture uh, poses. So, for example, um, uh, the, uh, in all ape range uh, uh, countries, uh, the killing or capturing of, a, of an ape is on paper criminalized is, 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 is unlawful. Uh, but when we look at the, 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 the nature of the threat that agro-industrial agriculture poses for uh, apes, it, it's not so much the, 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 the individual, the, the, the killing, it's the fact that the habitats are shrinking. And although it's true, as, as Mark says, that there is adaptability and there's potential for the, the fact is that the natural habitats are, are shrinking. And what we see for the, the, the NGOs, the organizations that have tried to use the law to, to, to protect uh, apes, they have quite often used other instruments, not environmental legislation, not uh, uh, legal instruments that protect apes, because other instruments are more useful given the nature of the challenge. So for example, restrictions on bushfires, uh, moratoria on large-scale concessions. Uh, so I think we also need to look at what, what are the specific challenges that this phenomenon uh, poses, and, and how best can those challenges be addressed? And the solution, the answer to those questions may not lie necessarily in the traditional answers we've had in terms of the way in which the environmental legislation has been drafted. So looking at land tenure, looking at uh, decision-making authority, uh, looking at creative use of the multiple levers that may exist for ensuring that the ultimate outcome is, is achieved. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Great. yeah, to sum up, in all countries, ranch countries with great apes, all the great apes everywhere are protected, but their habitat is not necessarily protected. So that's why you're completely right. I mean, if we really want to protect great apes, we need to find ways you know, to incentivize the protection of the forest, which is not necessarily protected. And this is a real challenge because there is a lot of different ways, but a lot of different obstacles to, to face and to overcome in the different countries where we work. So, I, either one of you, Tyler. I was just going to say, coming off of that, you know, there is one area of hope in Southeast Asia um, is actually potential for a new source of conservation finance. Um, you know, Doug and I actually worked together uh, for several years um, to get really large scale incentives for tropical forest conservation in U.S. and international climate legislation. Uh, we were wildly successful in getting uh, those provisions into U.S. climate legislation. If, if it had passed, it would have created 12 to $14 billion a year in financing for tropical forest conservation. Of course, the legislation itself uh, you know, just barely fell short and, and didn't pass, and so that's not in place now. In Europe, there is a fairly strong internet, uh, climate regime that is generating a lot of finance, but uh, tropical forest conservation tragically is not eligible uh, to be counted uh, to reduce the emissions. And it's really a missed opportunity because not only is it not protecting tropical forests, um, but because tropical forests are actually affordable to conserve, it means that Europe's climate targets are lower than they otherwise would be. But we um, you know, are constantly looking for new sources of financing to complement private sector efforts to reduce deforestation in their supply chain. 
One encouraging thing is that some of the big commodity companies in Southeast Asia have actually made commitments uh, to finance conservation and restoration at a large scale. Um, we've tried to encourage them to commit to the principle to conserve and ideally restore an area at least equivalent to that which they deforested in the past. Uh, Asia Pulp and Paper, um, which is you know, possibly the most notorious deforester in Southeast Asia, um, it's, it's cleared you know, something like three million acres or more of forest. It is actually committed to that principle and has started to restore forest um, on its plantations. It still has a lot of problems. You know, there's been fires burning in, in some of its suppliers' concessions. Um, but I think that's possible. And then you know, the key issue is you have to be confident that if you spend that money, it's actually going to work. Historically, in Indonesia, uh, there's been massive amounts of money allocated to forest restoration by the government, and almost 100% of it has ended up in the pockets of government officials, and there's been very, very, very few trees actually planted. Mm. Um, but these, these private sector actors want to see results, and I think by using some of the same carbon finance mechanisms that were used you know, in the heyday of, of carbon markets, you could actually see them have more results-oriented models that insulated them from substantial corruption uh, and actually allowed us to complement the efforts to reduce deforestation through the supply chain uh, with positive financial incentives for communities, for local and state and national governments. Hmm. Yeah, Doug, did you want to jump in too? Yeah, I just wanted to, to follow up on, on uh, what Lorenzo was talking about. The, the, the question of who owns, who controls forest land, I think is, is, is a really vital one. And, and here the contrast between Brazil and Indonesia, I think, is, is, is very instructive. Um, Brazil, starting about 15 years ago, uh, began large-scale transfers of land to indigenous peoples in the Amazon. Um, and this is, has, has, uh, is, has been really a, a remarkable extent. Over 20% of Amazon forest is now uh, the collective property of indigenous groups. Uh, that's an enormous area of land. And legally, they have the right to clear it. Uh, legally, these, these are not parks, uh, preserves. They are, this, this is their land, and they can, they can uh, uh, clear it if they wish. Um, but in reality, they clear very little of it. They maintain almost all of it as forest. Um, and that's, that, that has been one of the major reasons for the success in reducing deforestation. And it's not simply that they have legal title, that they have on paper uh, ownership of the land. It's that that has been enforced by government and, 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 and that the boundaries have been protected so that, in fact, they have effective uh, control over the land. Now you contrast that to, to Indonesia, where, where uh, uh, you know, you've had, had very little of that so far. Um, there was a, a decision by the Supreme Court of Indonesia the year before last um, that, that recognized the, the customary rights, the, the, the adat uh, uh, rights of, of, of uh, indigenous groups of, in uh, Indonesia. And you know, to the extent that that gets implemented, that that becomes effective. I think that could be a very important uh, uh, force for conservation in Indonesia. But you know, relatively little has happened so far. It, goes, it, it could go both ways. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's not because uh, the land is going to be uh, reallocated to native communities that they will necessarily keep the forest alive. And something I wanted to, to just add. I agree that technically it's possible to reforest or to restore an ecosystem, but at the end of the day, we know it's very costly. It takes a lot of time. So actually the priority is to really try to protect or to, to make sure that the forest that is standing remains there. Uh, so Glenn, maybe in the, in the Q&A, we can get to some sure. of the revolutions yeah. and initiatives that have come about. Um, because I, I do want to move in our last few minutes to some of, the, some of the initiatives, some of the solutions, some of the ways you've all brought it up that those of us maybe sitting in the audience or listening on the live stream can play a positive role, get involved in this. And so um, I think maybe something that we've all heard of before is the round table on sustainable palm oil. And we see the label, maybe make people make decisions on buying or not. So could you talk about that as a, as a model of stakeholders coming together towards an aim in sustainable palm oil and maybe some other examples of initiatives that have, that have worked um, uh, sure. in this field? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, 
a lot of the initiative has actually not been driven so much by multi-stakeholder roundtables, um, but actually by uh, advocacy campaigns that are putting direct pressure on individual companies that then have the capacity to change governments. Um, so uh, I think historically what we saw was that a lot of the big consumer companies, you know, they knew that deforestation was an, an issue. They faced kind of generalized pressure to do something about it. And there was this industry-backed body, the Roundtable on Sustainable Palm Oil, uh, that said, oh, we'll certify um, plantations and say that they're sustainable. Um, and then you just slap this seal of this nice green palm on your product and everything's okay, your consumers will be happy. Well, unfortunately, um, largely because of the dominance of the RSPO by uh, Malaysian and other uh, palm oil industry companies, the standards were so weak as to be, um, you know, certainly not meaningful enough. So the RSPO actually allows destruction of second, so-called secondary forests, which, you know, in many cases means there was a few logs taken out 40 years ago. Uh, Two-thirds of Asia's forests are secondary. Um, and it also, uh, you know, shockingly allows destruction of these ultra carbon rich ecosystems, peatlands, which are often home to you know, Sumatran, uh, Sumatran tiger habitat, orangutan, <coughs> and, and other creatures. Um, I think one of the kind of revolutions in mentality that both civil society had and now the corporate sector has had is that you really can't outsource your values. Um, the Forest Trust, which is an organization that has implemented a lot of these uh, private sector commitments, has really been strong in pushing this. Companies you know, really uh, can't just say, oh, there's a seal, and somebody says this is good. You have to investigate whether or not it's actually delivering. And once we had that change in mentality, uh, some great things started to happen. Um, the companies actually started to adopt much stronger criteria than the Roundtable on Sustainable Palm Oil. It's called the high carbon stock approach. It both protects high conservation value areas that are very biodiverse and also high carbon stock areas. Uh, and secondly, they began to insist on seeing results. Um, and that has really flown through the supply chain. So, you know, you have uh, several dozen uh, public facing consumer companies Kellogg's, Mars, Hershey's, uh, and, and Johnson and Johnson, many others that have committed to these strong protections. And actually, the big traders and even the producers in Indonesia and Malaysia have committed to those strong standards as well. And what you see now is that. 90% of global palm oil trade is covered by actually the stronger standard that was created by individual initiative, whereas RSPO, the weaker standard, is actually kind of a niche scheme that only covers 15%. Hmm. The other issue, just quickly, on, on, you know, I think, and this is very important when you talk about how consumers can make a difference. If you go to uh, RSPO or another scheme like that, there's real risks that you're creating a subsidy for deforestation. There's lots of land in Malaysia, peninsular Malaysia, that was cleared a long time ago, and by any measure is you know, considered sustainable now because it hasn't been cleared through recent deforestation. A company like IOI could get a subsidy for selling palm oil produced there, uh, and then use that money to finance their operations to clear forest and peatland in Borneo to clear orangutan habitat. And we have photos of them, of them doing that. Um, and, and so I, I think, um, when people started to look much more closely at individual companies, that's when they started to make much broader industry-wide change. You know, just finally to conclude, um, I think things are better in Indonesia than they would be had this great revolution not happened, although clearly it has not gone nearly as far enough. Um, you know, with our allies, we um, needed to change the most politically powerful Indonesian palm oil company, Astra International. Uh, it was clearing forests, orangutan habitat, Sumatran elephant habitat on a vast scale. Uh, and it also, uh, the director was the head of the Indonesia Palm Oil Producers Association, and he historically used that position to to change things, uh, to, to weaken law enforcement. By going after Mandarin Oriental, which was a, a hotel brand which is affiliated with them, by sending people dressed in elephant suits to their lobby, we were able to create sufficient pressure on that company to totally change its practices and its approach. We need a lot more of that, but by engaging on specific companies, I think it is possible. Thank you, and I, I know we need to stop right now, so I'm gonna allow, I know Lorenzo was writing, Mark has stuff to chip in, but. Um, we can get to that in the in the Q and A extended with the audience. Um, but please help me in thanking this really excellent panel. <laughs>
are going to open it up for the next um, 15 minutes to Q&A from the crowd. So if anyone has a question they'd like to ask, please. Oh, yeah. uh, Hi, I'm Chetan. Oh, and if you could um, identify yourself, what organization you're with. Sure, my name is Chetan Amirale. I'm from Humane Society International. And I was wondering if we could delve a little bit more into demand-side solutions. To me, it seems like some of these products, like palm oil, are going to international markets. Do we really need to be consuming this much palm oil? And the same thing with the soy. The soy generally goes to feed animals on industrial farm animal production facilities. The beef is generally not going to markets where people are suffering from malnutrition, but to markets where people are actually suffering from chronic disease and overnutrition. So is there a way that we can look at policies that would encourage more sustainable consumption, possibly starting here in the US and in Europe? Thanks. That's a great question, and it ties into some of the demand side consumer solutions that um, had been mentioned before. So who wants to start? Yeah, I'd, I'd be glad to. I, I think that's, that, 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 that's absolutely critical. Uh, the demand side is, is what drives these. And, and, and it is clear that now the demand is not to feed people who are hungry to increase the, 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 the you know the number of babies that, that are well nourished or the number of uh, children that can grow up well. It's to feed markets that make money <coughs> and in many cases provides products that, that are already consumed excessively. Beef, I think, is, is the clearest example where, where this is by far the the, the food that, that results in, in the greatest amount of greenhouse gases, you know, that, that, that uses uh, uh, two-thirds of global agricultural land and yet produces uh, less than 5% of, 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 of uh, the world's protein, less than 2% of the world's calories, and is associated with heart disease, with cancer, with diabetes, and, and clearly some countries in the world are consuming too much of it for their own good, for public health reasons. Um, and we're one of them. Uh, we're one of the highest consumers of, of, of beef in the world. Um, palm oil, uh, soybean oil, uh, 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 soybean as, as, as uh, livestock feed, uh, these are all increasing, uh, not because cause there's a demand for, for them by, by people that are hungry, but, but, but frankly because there's a demand for them by people who are already rich or in countries that are becoming richer. Um, and so I think, on the one hand, it's 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 absolutely critical to to to, to distinguish between the needs of the population, the needs of, of, of feeding the hungry, and what's driving uh, agricultural development leading to deforestation today. Uh, on the other hand, I think uh, the example has to be set by those of us who are in countries that are already consuming very high levels of these products. Uh, you know, we can't preach to, to, to tropical countries, you know, don't increase your beef consumption uh, if we're going to maintain the same very high level of beef consumption. I would like to paraphrase that. The other day I was surfing the web, sometimes you find exciting things in the web. And I saw these statistics, stati ah, stas statistics, thank you. With a growing human population, some scientists have estimated that in the next 40 years, the world will have to produce as much food as what has been produced in the past 8,000 years. Okay. This made me think about what is going to be the future for all these animals we want to preserve, all this natural ecosystem we want to preserve. And it's exactly back to your question. To me, it's about practices. We need to improve practices in the ground. We cannot just stop development from happening, because it will happen. So we need to work and make sure that these practices are better. And as consumers, all of us, we need to change our habit. I think this is a key thing. If we really want to have a better future, if we really want to minimize our impact, I think this is the only way to do so. But it's, to me, it's a hope, because this means that even if all of us who are part of the problems, we can also be part of the solution. It's our choice. So uh, that's why I thank you for this question, because especially if we are here in the USA, in Washington DC, in New York, or wherever, and we speak about the AIDS, we speak about orangutan conservation, gorilla conservation, a lot of people, they don't really seem, I mean, connected with that. But actually, we are all connected. And we can all act and it's by our daily choices. 
And it's actually working. I, I, I suspect in large part due to the work of the Humane Society, uh, red meat consumption in the United States is actually declining somewhat. I think yeah. we still eat way, way too much of it. Um, but this, this kind of effort, uh, you know, targeted changing behavior, uh, not only works when it's targeted at companies, but I think to a great extent also when targeted at individuals. We need to spread the world yeah. and become vegetarian. <laughs> but I'm not. Before we go to the next question, did you want to finish anything from? No, from I think that's fine. Okay. Anyone? Yep. Uh, my name is Valerie. I'm just a concerned. Oh, if we could get you to stand up. Thank please. you. Yes. No, my name is Valerie. I'm just a concerned citizen. Uh, you spoke about hunting, and I'm profoundly shocked. Do you mean orangutans and, and primates? And who hunts these animals, and why? And also, is it possible for citizens to um, be involved with nature conservancy and other efforts to sort of create some of these man-made preserves. Okay. Thanks for this question. Actually, scientists working uh, in our group have been doing a lot of uh, investigation in Borneo. And we found out, we estimate that every year, between two and 3,000 orangutans are killed, in average. Half of these orangutans are killed because of agro-industry and forest conversion and development. Half of these animals are killed for the bushmeat. And so these animals are killed by local people when they go hunting. They don't necessarily target primarily the orangutan, but let's say if they don't find anything this day on their way back from the forest, if they find an orangutan, they will kill an orangutan, they will eat the meat. This is a huge problem because even 3,000 orangutans every year, without speaking about all of these guys who are going to die this year because of El Nino and because of the fires, it's far too many compared to the population size that we are dealing with in Borneo. But this is an issue that is really difficult to speak about in Southeast Asia. People, for a reason, don't want to speak about the bushmeat trade. And this is a huge, a huge issue that we are facing currently over there. So we try to put the message across and we try to make people, especially in Malaysia and Indonesia, more aware about this and to stop that. Because orangutan are protected, so they are not supposed to do that to start with. In answer to your question about you know how to get involved, um, you know certainly giving money to some of the big conservation organizations is is a good thing to do. Um, I think what we've seen is uh, people getting involved either through donations or activism uh, with organizations like SomeOfUs.org, which has been heavily involved in the palm oil campaigns uh, that we've done, Union of Concerned Scientists. Uh, and uh, Greenpeace, uh, Rainforest Action Network. Um, I think these are the organizations, and hopefully ours, uh, that are um, really getting results and driving both private sector change and government change around the world and doing it in a kind of very systematic way. Dollar for dollar, um, these efforts are getting massive results. Uh, you know, I think when you spend one dollar in conservation directly, you get one dollar in conservation back. Uh, ideally, when you change whole systems of consumption, you're usually getting at least a thousand dollar return. Um, I would say the other interesting way to uh, engage that a lot of people don't know about or don't think about is as an investor. A lot of people have 401ks or, you know, other investments. Uh, and, you know, frankly, a lot you can you can ask that your um, the company that you invest with uh, not finance uh, palm oil companies, uh, soybean companies, cattle ranching processors that are engaged in deforestation. Um, you can also invest in uh, funds like Green Century Capital Management, which is actually owned by a coalition of environmental groups, and they you know they're. First of all, you know, dedicated to delivering returns to the people that invest with them, but they also use a small percentage of, of that, their, their profits, to actually finance advocacy. And it's been one of the most effective uh, ways to make change. So, you know, a, you know, with Wilmar, with ADM, with Bungie, with Kellogg's, with a lot of these companies, we ask Green Century and invest, other investors representing about $5 trillion in assets under management to engage with the companies and to put pressure on them. And it really worked. Um, when we were launching our big campaign on Wilmar, uh, we targeted Kellogg's, which had a joint venture with them. And Green Century's um, shareholder advocate got on the phone with Kellogg's CEO when he was doing a shareholder call. And she got to ask a question. And not only was he put on the spot, there was a Bloomberg News reporter on the, on the call. And then he made that uh, issue about Kellogg's having an alliance with a palm oil company that was clearing rainforest, 
the central issue of his coverage. And that forced the Kellogg CEO to call the Wilmar CEO and one of, was one of the things that contributed to the victory. So I think there's, you know, classic activism is probably the, the actually the thing that drives the change the most, but also think about how your dollars could make a change as well through Green Century or other funds. If, if I could just add, one of the, the, the sort of silver linings of globalization is that multinational companies uh, consumer goods companies uh, uh, like the ones Glenn has, has been mentioning are incredibly sensitive to the value of their brand. Uh, and in many cases, the value of their brand, this, this intangible, their, their image, what people think of them, is a very substantial part of the total capitalization of the company, which means that being associated with, with anything people don't like, and certainly deforestation is something people don't like, um, is a real threat to them, a threat to their bottom line. And this gives uh, the NGO community, this gives, gives consumers and, 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 and activist citizens uh, a potential real source of power, particularly using things like social media. Um, for example, we, we uh, <coughs> a few months ago um, started a, a, a campaign asking uh, Starbucks to adopt a deforestation-free palm oil uh, uh, policy, which they, they, they uh, uh, had, had, had been unwilling to do. Um, within three days, we generated um, a, a, a five million uh, a, a contacts through Twitter and Facebook. And the day after that, they called us up and said, we'd like to talk. Um, so that's, that's the sort of potential uh, uh, that, that we have um, as activists, which really you know, is a 21st century phenomenon. Um, and it's, it's, it's precisely using the fact that, that, that companies uh, do not want anything to tarnish the value of their brand because it, it hits their bottom line. And I, I think that is absolutely true of companies. It needs to be true of countries as well. Uh, you know, brand in Indonesia makes money off of raw selling raw commodities like palm oil and paper. And I think these consumer companies have to ask themselves a fundamental question. If you've destroyed two million hectares in five months, can products from Indonesia actually be considered sustainable? That's kind of the next level question we have to ask. And I'm gonna give Mark the last word because we're wrapping up right now. Uh, Lorenzo, yeah. last words? I was words. just going to- uh, Two last words, Lorenzo and Mark. Uh, just to, um, <laughs> I, I do believe in the difference that uh, informed and engaged consumers can make. I do believe in the difference that investors can make. Um, I think a key agent of change in all this, uh, uh, however, is also the uh, NGOs, the associations that are actually based in these countries. Uh, and many of them have been advocating very vocally, very effectively on these issues, in some cases in contexts that are quite different, uh, quite difficult because of intimidation, harassment, uh, whether it's physical, whether it's defamation lawsuits. I mean, there's, there's a, lot ha or, or a lot of that happening. And so I think in terms of looking at, you know, where do we want to uh, invest, I think we also got to invest in those players who actually are on the ground, who are in a position to uh, make sure that the commitments of the company announced are uh, honored, who can make sure that the legislation that exists on paper can be enforced through media engagement, through advocacy. Um, and so I, I think there is a sort of complex problems require multiple and complex solutions. And I think all of all that has been said is, is true. And we'll, we need to add this important element, how do we create alliances that bridge the, uh, this sort of high level uh, or, of advocacy with the grassroots level of advocacy? Yeah. Because actually, in the longer term, it is engaged, informed, active citizens in this country that are going to drive the change. It's going to be more difficult to drive the change from the outside in the longer term. So. Well, that's great. And we didn't even get the chance to talk about media local, regional, national, international media and, and generating, creating the spotlight. Um, really good points, Mark. Do you want to Yeah, because in two words, bottom line that there is not enough people on the ground to do all mm -hmm. what we are speaking about. Something else I think we need to keep in mind as well is that we spoke about the oil palm industry. Sure enough, the oil palm industry is one driver of extinction, but it's not the only one, fortunately. There are a lot of many other drivers 
the situation is highly complex and that's why I really think that we need more people on the ground, more projects to work with local communities, to work with local governments, to try to find innovative solutions to address all these issues that we are facing today. Sure enough, social media is an amazing opportunity, but there are some limitations with that. We will add, uh, target only a few of these drivers. Some other drivers need to be addressed directly there on the ground. And there is room for everyone, everybody to, yeah, to play this part, I think. Well, that's a that's great, message. great way to end. Thank you. Thank you to all four of our panelists and for your participation. <laughs>